Coach and Automation Podcast listeners, welcome back to another deep dive into the techniques that convert leads. I'm your host, Casey Arias, and today I am joined by Patrick Boyd and Jeff Schaefer of Finexa. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being on here. Um, how is everybody feeling today? Also, Vic. I'm so sorry, Vic. Welcome also to the podcast. He's, he's like, it's fine. No worries. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Don't worry about me. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's get right into it. So first to start off with, um, I'd like you, uh, if you could tell me a little bit about Finexa and what you guys do. Absolutely. Uh, Finexa is an enterprise-grade software suite. We're built by performance marketers for performance marketers. We have a global footprint of a little north of 200 employees and provide a singular solution for tracking, distribution, reporting, and analytics related to marketing campaigns for calls, leads, and clicks. We serve clients in multiple verticals and have a particularly strong focus in industries with high volume traffic. Our clients range from large affiliate networks to direct advertisers with complex marketing use cases and customer journeys such as insurance carriers, lenders, and home service providers. I want to go and, 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 and add that this, uh, you were, with our partnership with Finexa, um, especially for industries, you know, including home services, for example, right, where, where they're encroaching on that, they have really, I've seen so many, but they have the simplest um, solution. And there's like, you, you mentioned lead management there, tracking, reporting. Um, how, how do you, I mean, People will probably be interested, oh, what, what do you guys do? What's that service look like? And you guys can can go and it'll be in the description how to connect here with, with Jeff and Patrick. But just one thing, Jeff, is a lot of people in these industries with the traffic and leads in particular, they're very interested when they meet with you guys and on like how you guys are able to go and mitigate thousands, if not tens of thousands worth of costs on duplicates. Because, you know, there's a lot of cannibalization when it comes to that. Can you talk a little bit about that, the duplication and how you guys are saving companies like tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars managing through that? Or is that something that Patrick uh, handles? Like, I want to get like the audience to kind of like understand how important that is. Okay. So, yeah, one, one of the issues that we see with a lot of uh, lead buyers right now, like you mentioned, Vic, is just the amount of duplicate leads that are coming in the system. So... Oftentimes, these are leads that people are paying for. Uh, so one, you shouldn't even be paying for a lead that you've already seen before, because if you've already seen it, there's a good chance that you haven't serviced it for a good number of reasons. Um, two, you're going to piss off your sales team or whoever is responsible for contacting that lead uh, because it's just a waste of time. It's not a real fresh lead on their end. Um, so Finexa in place has, uh, you know, basically provided a solution where we can one mitigate that. So the lead doesn't even hit your system. So one, your sales reps aren't wasting time on it and you're not paying for that lead. Um, this is a big issue that we're seeing across several different industries. You know, like I said earlier, we have home services, insurance, finance, uh, legal ed, even education too. So um, you know, we, we've definitely put some tools in place that can help mitigate a lot of the quality as it relates to du uh, duplicates. Yeah. And, and people are going to see this on the podcast when we do, you know, it's definitely shorts and we'll, we'll put like graphics for those people, like they'll do math very easily in their head. But if we were to go and do that and, and you know, in many industries, let's say the average cost is like a hundred dollars for a lead, right? Um, many, that's kind of like a nice little aggregate average, whether you're in finance, auto, home services, manufacturing, uh, even with e-commerce, with certain e-commerce products, right, high-end products. So if you have a hundred duplicates in a month, and you're spending a hundred dollars, that's like ten grand. So a hundred dollars, hundred duplicates a month, and you know companies will see that. Even I've seen companies with that that buy maybe a thousand leads, and a, a ten percent of its duplicates. So they're already spending ten grand a month. Now, so the question becomes really, really simple, right? Does it cost more than ten grand? for a company who's having this issue to go and use your service? No, it does not. Not typically. Um, you know, tip, we, we do have some clients that, that pay us far north of that. Um, and those are clients that I particularly love, but uh, it is a very low cost solution in general where you're, you know, to mitigate a $10,000 issue is not going to be a $10,000 solution on our end. Yeah, because what, what I understand, and they can go through this, if you got the audience who's listening, you know, doing a quick demo with with with, with uh, Patrick or Jeff's team, right? 
you guys will be able to go and, and, and understand this more. But from what I understand, you're talking about pennies compared to like $10,000, you know, maybe a couple of hundred bucks when you get those leads and you ingest them for, and then the time and effort it takes to call. Like you, I like what you said, people go and waste time, opportunity cost, wasting time, you know, going through it, like processing these duplicates. Those are all, you add that to the 10 grand that you just spent on duplicates. So I think what, what, what I want the audience to figure out is like, okay, well, if I'm spending, you know, a couple, like five figures on duplicates, well, was this system, what is that? And it, it, you know, from what I know, it's you're, you're talking about like a 10th of that percentage. And it's worth mentioning also Vic, that, you know, this problem is only going to get worse. We live in a world now where consumers are faster shoppers than they've been in the past. And there's a need for immediate gratification to get in touch with the given service provider type. Consumers now have the ability to submit any number of inquiries much faster than they did before. And as the funnels improve and as we have lead generators that are doing everything they can to make it easy for consumers to push themselves through the funnel, that trend is only going to continue. So it's not just the topic of duplicate elimination and mitigation. The topic is being able to do that in real time as well. Yeah, that's actually an excellent transition over to what I was going to ask you. Like, how do clients typically react when they see real-time data versus what they had in place previously? Because that could be a little bit of a, a shock to the system sometimes when you're like kind of used to reacting on feeling versus like actually seeing that data come in live. What makes a huge difference and to what degree and how really varies based on the individual business. Obviously, we cater to all sorts of clients ranging from lead generators and affiliate networks all the way to direct advertisers that are purchasing leads for the purposes of selling them their given product or service. Uh, the commonality amongst all of these is simply that when you have real-time data, you can make better, faster, more accurate decisions. If you are a direct advertiser looking to experiment with and find your best lead sources, you want to be able to plug those lead sources in and give them a test run without having to wait a month, two months to be able to reconcile data from multiple disparate systems and make a business decision. We provide a mechanism through which our clients can easily plug in those lead sources, see real-time data, make decisions whether those leads are being ingested for their own business purposes or whether they're attempting to monetize those by selling that traffic. So the other benefit comes from simply the reduction of manual labor and man hours that go into reporting and reconciliation from multiple systems. By being able to have a real-time aerial view, whether it's from 30,000 feet or whether it's super, super granular down to the lead level, you're able to make better business decisions. And so to your question about how do businesses react when they see this sort of data, it turns on a light bulb, right? It gets their gears turning as far as what operational savings they can uh, effectuate, what they can do as far as being able to try out new vendors without taking the financial risk associated with letting a bad actor uh, send them traffic for a month or whatever the case is. And the same thing goes for those that are selling. By having real-time data and being able to measure what's selling to who, how well those leads or calls or monetizing what they're selling for and being able to make business decisions in real time makes a huge difference. Yeah. I was just thinking because we've experienced this when we've gone over data analytics with people is um, we almost have, they don't say it directly, but it's like, how dare you tell me the truth? You know, when they, when they can see things not going in their direction. I was just kind of wondering if you guys were experiencing the same thing. You know, the, the thing that I really like about the, the system here, and, and again, because I've seen it live, one, if, if you're not using a system like Finex's, you're probably spending those duplicates anyway, a couple of grand, 10,000, maybe even 100,000. We've seen customers of ours who spend half a million dollars worth of, um, and, and they have duplicates over a period of time that's in the six figures, like per quarter. You're going to be spending a tenth of that, you know, with the system. Because I think what Jeff and, and Patrick is, is, is putting here is that if I'm a, if I'm in the call center, it's call centers, right? Like we'll probably benefit from this a lot. If you have a call center, 
you'll see it and you'll go, oh man, th these leads I'm ingesting, I'm buying at a hundred bucks a piece. I'm getting like 10, 20% of them being duplicates and it's just, I'm spinning my wheels and my agents are, and my salespeople are getting pissed off. So one, you'll save all, on, all, on that frustration. Two, I think when your question is good one, Casey, about them seeing it real time, I just see all the VPs that we, we talk about with regards to what, uh, you know, companies like Finexa can offer. If you're a VP or the head of the marketing or the CFO, you will actually see the real time and you'll go, I need to go and pause that campaign because it's costing me money and it's not doing that. And you can compare it to the other lead generators because their system will be able to show you exactly like here's one lead generator versus the 99 other generators that I that I have and what that performance looks like in real time. And if you have call centers, you can go and make adjustments and go, you know what, we need to go and hit up on these queues or these leads because they're the ones that are converting versus these ones, uh, we've got to go and make these particular adjustments. I think the question then becomes, why do you think if, if let's say your system will cost a thousand bucks and they're spending $10,000 on waste on just leads and the time that it takes to go and waste, right? Going through this, uh, waiting a month to go and do the reporting, you know, like Casey, Casey knows this in many industries, the VP won't know until the end of the month. And then at the end of the month, they go like, oh my God, this, I've been spending all this money on these lead generators and it hasn't given me anything. You guys have the inside on both the lead buyers. And so the question becomes, why isn't everybody using it then? What, what's causing that? Yeah, I, I think one of the main reasons that people are slower to adopt this kind of technology, and we we see more on the the publisher, the lead generator side, um, a you know higher propensity to adopt our our solution. I think in terms of the actual lead buyers, um, I think there's just a lot of a lot more red tape in these organizations. Oftentimes, when we're dealing with a lot of these lead generators, it's just a one or two man shop that, that has a company and can quickly make decisions. With actual lead buyers, they're more established logos. They have processes that they have to go through. And a lot of them are kind of afraid to adopt a new solution, to, to take that leap of faith. Um, and I think they really need to see it too. I think it's, it's hard to explain what we do to somebody, not necessarily hard, but um, I think the visual aspects help when, you know, whenever we get a chance to actually demo our solution for somebody, it becomes apparent within, you know, a minute or so how valuable the data is because we give such easy access to it. So I think it's just more getting in front of these people and just showing them the solution and the data and analytics and visualizations that we can provide. Um, I think is if once we get them there, we see a lot higher, uh, close rate with those clients. So, so in terms of scale because I get excited about this because it sounds like it could be for everyone. But let's say I'm a smaller company. I ingest uh, 200, 250 leads a week. Am I, it, does it make sense for me to go and say, Jeff, Patrick, do a demo for me? Or am I too small? No, I, I think that we can, the, the, the beautiful thing about Finexa is we have a usage model so you're only paying for what you use. So it's not necessarily a system that is strictly built for people that are doing uh, a ton of leads. We have a good bulk of clients who are doing very nominal leads who have a use case where they potentially just want two simple things, right? The ability to vet out all of their lead sources and two, to reject duplicates or bad quality leads. Um, so there's a use case really for everybody with us. And I think the usage model that we've put in place is is really been effective and um, made it easy for for you know smaller scale customers to adopt. So if if the if the lead um, buyers love you, I mean they will because now you're saving money on duplicates. They see it real time. They're not wasting their time. They're saving money and making and doing more. You know for their call center, their salespeople. What does that do to the lead sellers? They may end up hating you guys and saying, man, this company's like creating this chaos because I used to just be able to sell whatever I want. Now the lead buyers have the power to go and hold me accountable and compare me to other lead uh, sellers. How does that dynamic work? Well, first I would say that the better lead generators in this space, and really this is across verticals, want transparency, right? They work hard to ensure that they are providing top quality leads that can convert, and they want clients to be able to measure them equally with 
other lead sources. Uh, additionally, to your previous question regarding why there may be challenges for adoption with direct advertisers or lead buyers, I would tell you that there's an acceptance and complacency when dealing in the affiliate world from these lead buyers of, well, that's just how it is. And we're here to say it, it doesn't have to be. When you look at issues like lead duplication, you look at issues like lead fraud, uh, issues like the same consumer coming through multiple channels, these are things that have just been accepted for a long, long time. And if you look at, for example, real-time reporting and real-time analytics, being able to measure affiliate performance for web leads or for phone calls and being able to measure that, and this is kind of a big concept for a lot of people to grasp, but with the same level of accuracy and in the same period of time as you would measure performance from a Google Ads campaign or a Facebook campaign, that to some is uh, mind-bending that you can have mechanisms in place to look at your affiliate traffic in the same way that you would look at traffic from any other source, right? We're in a world where even these direct advertisers that may be uh, new-ish to being able to measure affiliates with the same level of scrutiny and in the same way as they would measure other sources, uh, that may seem very, very foreign, right? But even they would expect, if you look at a Google Ads campaign from a given day, you're going to be able to measure those results in real time at that moment, right? And we're providing a mechanism to be able to kind of shift the paradigm of how these uh, lead buyers that are ingesting leads for their own business would look at affiliate traffic. And if I can add actually one thing to that, um, you know, it, it, it really does benefit the lead seller too. I mean, like Jeff said, it's, it's not, you know, we're not here to only help the lead buyer and, you know, basically, you know, put it, paint a target on the lead generators back. Um, I do think it actually benefits the lead seller as well. If lead buyers are giving them that transparency. Uh, one of the ways specifically is, you know, just by routing the full lead details to the buyer that's willing to pay for it. Uh, if you have a lead buyer that rejects a lead because it's duplicate, you know, it's, it has a high fraud score, um, you know, whatever the reason is, it, it does help the lead seller increase their revenue per lead because now they can actually post that lead somewhere else for somebody that maybe it fits their criteria better, uh, rather than the person that rejected it. So it, it does really institute kind of a level of, of self-regulation for that company too. Additionally, it puts everybody more or less on the same playing field as far as transparency goes. Uh, in general, if we're talking about lead buyers, direct advertisers, more often than not, their counterparts, the networks, lead sellers, et cetera, are the ones that actually tend to be more technically savvy with regards to software like ours. And so by having a solution like ours in place on the lead buyer side, uh, any information related to lead performance, sub ID performance, et cetera, can be relayed back to that lead seller in real time so they can make adjustments. The other thing to keep in mind is simply that the lead seller is not, in many cases, the original source of the lead. We have to keep in mind, starting at the bottom of the funnel, if the lead buyer, say a home services company, has relationships with five different lead vendors, those five different lead vendors may be selling them traffic from hundreds of different sources, right? And if one or two of those sources for a given lead vendor are the bad actor that's impacting what the bottom of funnel performance is for that given client, the lead seller wants to know that right away. What they don't want is for a month, two months to go by, when there's no reporting and say the metric that the home services company was really looking for is we need a 15% conversion from this lead source. If it's not 15%, abandon ship, we're giving them a 60-day trial. Well, at the end of the 60-day trial, maybe it's at 14.5% and the committee says clip this lead vendor. If they had had that reporting in place in real time, adjustments could have been made. Maybe it's one bad actor, one, one publisher somewhere up the chain, that's sending the traffic that's bringing down the overall conversion. So if I'm a lead seller, I absolutely want real-time feedback. I know that time is, is my enemy, especially when there's bad data going through. So in an ideal world, if I'm selling you leads, I have, I'm plugged into the matrix, right? 
I know exactly how you're performing, how your team's uh, fielding these different leads. I know exactly how you're converting. And I know the information that may have taken me in the past a month, two months to hear from you after you reconcile reports from five different uh, platforms. I'd like to know that right away because I can go ahead and make adjustments to what I'm selling you to make sure that I'm meeting your needs as my customer if I'm the lead seller. Lots of companies talk about speed to lead. It's speed of information, right? Because you go, especially for, if you're buying more than, you know, 50, 100 leads a day, I mean, just imagine dollar wise, you know, every day you could go and say, hmm, I can make an adjustment here. I can inform my lead, you know, sellers what these issues are and they can do better for me the very next day or maybe the next few days. Um, you know, it, it, it's just perplexing. And I think this is the message here for, for those of you guys are listening here or watching us on YouTube or TikTok or LinkedIn, um, you know, whether it's Finexa or, you know, something else, but you guys need to go and take a look at this because with regards to the speed of the information and the money that you're saving, um, I think maybe what we could go and do is, is tackle that piece is, um, at least from my perspective, what I see is what's something that Patrick and maybe Patrick can elaborate on this. A lot of uh, VPs or maybe people who have not used this uh, or have not like kind of gotten, because you said it's new, right? It's kind, of, it's kind of getting to that piece. They're intimidated with technology. Um, like how, like how would you go and alleviate that and say, look, you're not going to need a degree on statistics and analytics to be able to use this. Like an 11 year old, can an 11, can an 11 year old who has training use your system? If I demo them properly, I'm absolutely certain they could. <laughs> good. Okay. It just, it just, there'd be a couple things, you know, yeah, I don't know how good they are with, with reading APIs and building integrations, but you know, we, there, YouTube is available for those 11 year olds now. So I'm sure an 11 year old could figure it out. That's only a small part of the platform though. Uh, yeah, to be honest, I do think an 11 year old could use our platform. That's good. I mean, that look, you, you've said a couple of things there that, you know, may even scare some people, but just keep in mind for those of you guys out there, like there are documentation and they, there is support that's provided by both our team as well as the Finexa team, um, especially if you're in specific industries. And so really you end up using the product, but that's really something important here. If an 11 year old can, can use this and it's going to save you money, then really there shouldn't be any fear of being able to go and, 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 and take this on and adding it to your, to your stack to help improve not only your costs, but your ability to communicate with your lead sellers, uh, as well as I guess the call centers, the salespeople and, and doing all of this in, in, in real time. What do you think case? Well, I mean, you don't have to really worry about catering to a 10 year old because we're talking about 11 year olds here. So, you know, that extra year, that's when they're getting all of their knowledge, right? <laughs> At least that's what I hear from the grapevine. Um, I want to talk about a little bit, um, we're, we're talking about like speed lead, right? But like the name of the game is conversion. And then even more so than that is sales. So like we talk a lot about conversion rate and increasing conversion rate on this show. Um, and you guys deal a lot in the analytics as well, just like us. And so, um, if somebody is coming to you and they're, and they're like, Hey, you know what? I, I feel like, I mean, I'm looking at my numbers. They're not really getting adjusted all that much in the way that I want them to be adjusted. What's the quickest and best way I can increase my conversion rate? You know, obviously speed to contact is crucial. Everybody talks about that. It's not a new concept. So we're not going to talk about speed to contact, but just because you're first doesn't mean you're best, uh, particularly in competitive markets. And marketers now live in this world where consumers expect immediate gratification. If their needs and questions aren't addressed immediately, they look elsewhere. So my advice to any business looking to immediately improve their conversion rate is to build a plan around the answer to one simple question. Maybe not that simple, depending on your business. But the question is, how do I immediately take this potential customer off of the market. In other words, it, how can you design a process around marketing and sales engagement, which takes a consumer that would otherwise continue to shop and look at your competitors, whether they've talked to you or not, and create a journey which stops the shopping process in its tracks, regardless of whether a sale will be made immediately or not. 
and this is different for every business, but by designing processes around the answer to this question, conversions will increase regardless of the sales cycle duration. We're talking a lot about data and data points. Uh, what do you think is like the main points that clients should be paying attention to if their business is based a lot like or solely on incoming leads? Like what are those data points that people really need to keep in mind and watch? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple, right? There's the, the quick ones that you can easily see and easily digest and get a feel for um, immediately. You know, those are things like contact rates. You know, is your company even able to get a hold of this consumer? Um, that prompts a speed to contact question. You know, how quickly do you need to contact an incoming lead in order for you to actually be able to contact them or book an appointment or just get in touch with them in general? I think this is a, something important because it highlights how competitive you are in the market. Uh, you know, we are in a market where a lot of lead sellers are selling the same lead to multiple buyers. So you are at the mercy of, of, of the clock really to, to get in touch with this consumer. Those are quick things that you can obviously identify um, on incoming leads with Infinexa. Another thing is the conversion rates. That's really the obvious one. If the leads aren't converting, it's it's really just money wasted, especially if you're paying for these leads. But there is a bigger picture here, and this isn't necessarily to do with the with the day to day, you know, call center managers. Uh, but this data that you're utilizing, that that quick uh, data that you're being able to ingest is going to highlight something bigger. Ultimately, the goal with, with Finexa for, for lead buyers is really to help identify what your customer acquisition costs. You know, the, the aggregate cost to acquire just one single paying customer for one specific channel. Having access to that data is so paramount because a lot of lead buyers are going to need to understand what the lifetime value of that, uh, sorry, what the lifetime value of that client actually is and be able to quickly measure it against the customer acquisition cost. That really is a, a, a you know a fancy way of saying if you're profitable or bankrupt. Okay, cool. So you're saying like Finexa can do all of this without any additional add-ons. This just comes with the basic Finexa package? We provide data. We're not saying we're gonna help you lower your customer acquisition costs and increase the lifetime value of the client. Our data though should provide insights which is going to enable you to be able to do all of that. Yeah, and, and how, lo how long have you guys been doing this? Because a lot of people who are listening, and in certain industries, like you could be around for a while, but tell us a little bit about like how long have you guys been doing this, what you constantly innovate, and just give you know certain industries that we work with that may not have heard of you and say, oh yeah, they've been around for, for this amount of time. So Finexa actually started as a proprietary tool uh, for a very large affiliate network in the subprime finance space. So Finex actually didn't start as a standalone company. It was an internal tool that was basically built. And then that started, like I said, in the finance space, but then we branched out to insurance and home service, I want to say uh, about seven to 10 years ago, somewhere in that in that range. Oh, wow. Okay. It's been I long, obviously okay. was not here around then. Um, I might or might not have been born. I don't know. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's been a while and, and, and I think now it's just getting to a point where um, more and more people that it's, you know, it's something, you know, top of mind for them. Um, you know, I think one of the things I like, I, I want to go in and ask is, is this, you know, you guys seem to be very successful. Patrick here, you're, you're the VP for sales, right? Is that your, your that's your position, right? And Jeff, here's the, the, the CEO, right? COO for, for, for Finexa. So we have a lot of you know younger people again be being on TikTok and YouTube, uh, and as well as people who listen to the podcast who don't want to be a TikTok or a YouTube influencer, right? They they want to go like I want to have a career in analytics or reporting or a platform or SaaS, uh, something in your industry. So can you tell us a little story about how you came about? You know, you Patrick being you know vice president of sales and Jeff here being you know um, part of the C level suite here, the chief uh, operating officer for. For Finexa, how do you guys become successful? What's the advice you could give to the to the uh, to the youth so that they don't just think, okay, well, my options are being an influencer on TikTok or 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 YouTube? <laughs> yeah, I would sum up my answer to that in two words: psychology and economics. And I, I don't mean the degrees, but understand the people that you're working with. Understand what motivates them. And that goes across the board, whether you're dealing with a client, a mentor, a potential employer, whatever that may be, 
understand the human component because behind every system, every computer, every company, there's somebody or multiple people that are making decisions. There is a, a drive that's coming from that person. So understand the psychology and understand how the money works. Whatever business you're going to be in and whatever your role is, whether you're an analyst, whether you're running Excel reports, whether you're in sales or whether you're, you're an admin, understand how the business makes money. Understand the revenue component to it. And if you do those two things, you'll be, as a young professional, looking at things through a different lens than many of your peers do. I, th I think my advice, especially if you're a little bit younger, is just to be curious and ask a lot of questions for things that you don't know. Um, I always ask people when I don't understand something, I make them explain it to me as if I'm a third grader. And you have to have no shame in I doing that. You have to yeah, you basically have to say, look, I'm stupid. I don't understand what you're saying. Explain it to me, please. Draw it out here. And you have to make people do that. And, and I think that's really something that has to do with getting out of your comfort zone. Nobody likes admitting that they don't understand something. Everybody wants to be the smartest person in the room. I've done it myself sometimes too. But I think once you really embrace that and, and ask a lot of questions and get curious about what you don't know and put yourself in a vo vulnerable state where um, you're you might make yourself look a little stupid, I think in the long term it's it's going to pay off for you a lot. Yeah, that's that's really good. I, I really like that you you know for those of you guys you know Patrick you talked about obstacle is the way. It's a really good book by Ryan Holiday. That's the actual title. Um, you know Ryan Holiday. If you're you know shout out man from Ch Channel Automation Podcast over here. Um, but in sales, like your VP of sales and, you know, lots of the younger audiences who may have the mis like, you know, everybody's in sales. Can you tell us like some of the exciting things? I think that's what people want. Like if you want to get into sales, you want to be a VP one day of sales. What's exciting? What can you do? What do you enjoy about you traveling? All of these things, going to events, talking to people, having good dinners, like talk a little bit about that so that people will go like, oh yeah, that's definitely something I could do. Yeah, I, I think sales is exciting because it's one of the few roles in any organization where there's no ceiling for your your earning potential, really. It's, it's really as hard as you work, but not only as hard, but how savvy you work. Look, sales, a lot of it is just how you communicate with people. Um, and I, I think if, if you do talk good for a living, I, I think it helps certainly, but uh, it is a career where you get to interface and talk to a lot of people. So if you have a problem shutting your mouth like I do, uh, it's a perfect avenue for you. But, you know, the, the earning potential really is unlimited. It really just is depending on or dependent on how hard, how savvy you work. Um, and it's it's a good career to be in. Very, very well said. Yeah, and I agree. Like, um, I mean, I was always one of those people who got the, the messages sent home from my teachers that says, yeah, she's talking to in class, you know, she's giving too much information. She's, you know, just keep to herself, you know, maybe a career in sales, maybe a career in hosting a podcast is for you. Jeff, your chief operating officer, for those, the audience members, the people who are up and coming in their career, how did you get there? Tell us a story about, you know, how do, how does one become a chief operating officer? What do you do? What's exciting about it? Well, frankly, without uh, without being too humble about it, I really think that being a COO is the best role. If you're somebody who's stimulated and excited to be able to have your hands in multiple different departments and projects, and you're a relentless problem solver, and particularly if you're good at finding problems, right? There's finding problems and being able to find solutions to them. But you have to first be able to find them, identify them, identify the the people that may have contributed to not even so much a problem, but something that can be improved, right? The mentality of looking something at something that's a problem as an area for room for improvement, right? Um, but it's exciting, the ability to first have a focus on marketing and then on business development and then on partnerships or product development, whatever that may be. It's a very a diverse sort of role and gives, if you're the kind of person that gets bored doing just one thing over and over again, and you like to be able to really, really absorb and understand what every gear in an engine is doing, absolutely, uh, it would be a, a role that I would aspire to. As far as my, my personal trajectory goes, without going too far into the weeds, 
I would just say that, you know, much like Patrick, I, I started my career on the sales side. Eventually, as a salesperson, I got very frustrated with being beholden to the marketing team to generate leads for me. So I went and learned marketing. Eventually, I got frustrated with how, uh, you know, given business may have been operating and, and learned more about business operations and learned more about how to improve processes and people and hiring and everything else. But I would say as a young professional, start with what you're good at. People tend to like doing things that they're good at, right? Find out what you're, what you're good at. Play to a natural talent. If you're not good at it, practice it, learn it. You may find that you're good at something you didn't know you were good at. And then grow from there. My other piece of advice would be learn how to do the jobs of others, whether you want that job or not. If you're in sales, understand enough about marketing that even if you can't necessarily drive the car, you at least know what kind of gas to put in. If you're in marketing, understand what's happening with the leads that you're sending over to sales, because you may not get that feedback. If you're in some other role and you have a counterpart that you're interacting with, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Understand their job, understand their challenges because it'll give you an opportunity to have a fresh set of eyes on potential challenges that, that they may be dealing with in their day-to-day. But I would say it's really key to understand enough about the jobs that those around you are doing so that you can understand how they impact your role. We've experienced consistent growth over the last several years. We are hiring. We are growing. If you're passionate about being in the performance marketing software space and you're looking to find a home with opportunity for advancement, whether it's sales, marketing, business operations, if you think there's something special about you and you can contribute to a rapidly growing organization with the best offering in our space, please reach out. A wise man once told me that operation is for OP is other people. And I'll cut out the last thing that he said about uh, what S stands for. But I think that COO is absolutely the person who keeps things uh, running. And yeah, if you have an interest in having your fingers in every single department, that's the way to do it. So thank you both, Jeff, Patrick from Finexo. We're going to be putting your information in the... Uh, bio below wherever you're listening to this podcast so if you want to hit them up and learn more about Finexa and get your analytics running smoothly go ahead and check the description and it's going to have that information there and that's going to be it for us today so whether you love or hate what we talked about today we do want to hear from you so comment or shoot us an email at hello at channelautomation.com and also please consider subscribing to our podcast and our social media uh, if you want to get marketing tips and uh, stuff to help your call centers and your marketing team.